Hello, friends. So I'm Andrea Lynn, and in this uh, next interview, I speak with the lovely English Rose, Helen Pluckrose. She goes all into epistemology or ways of knowing. It was a very, very stimulating interview. I wish it could have even been longer. And we talk about postmodernism and why it was uh, different from other movements of critique uh, around the time. And then we talk about um, applied postmodernism and yeah, the different ways of, of knowing things, of knowing truth. So it's kind of adding on to my this series uh, where we're looking at applied postmodernism on my channel. We, as in me and you guys, I guess. Um, so I spoke with uh, Jim Lindsay and Mike Nana about all this uh, a couple months back. And so now I'm bringing it around and getting down deep into the foundations with Helen. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy and uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Oh, and uh, don't forget to subscribe if you have not yet. Hello, Helen Pluckrose. Hello. Thanks for having me here. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate it. I've been wanting to have you on for a while and it's worked. You've been to Australia and back, so... <laughs> You're a world traveler. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay, let's get right down into the epistemology, because that's what I am told. <laughs> I'm told, I'm told by your cohorts, well, by Jim, that you are, that's your specialty, that you're, that's, that's where you live is the, well, let's define epistemology. Right, but well, yeah, epistemology is how we just how we know what's true. So there's um, a lot of um, philosophy under the title epistemology, but all what I'm talking about really here now is how how do we know things are true and the difference between the sort of liberal um, enlightenment um, focus on science and reason and evidence generally, and the postmodern. Um, understanding of knowledge which is much more to do with experience um feelings are connected to identity and position in society okay so that's why i talk about epistemology a lot <laughs> okay so and i guess to be um clear uh this is regarding you you and jim and peter's work on um the sort of grievance studies applied postmodernism and mm -hmm. so so why is, when we're talking about applied postmodernism, why is going down to the epistemology the key to understanding it, as opposed to, I guess, seeing it played out and, I guess, observing it and even reading, I guess, you know, the profess different professors or different writers' works on it? I mean, why, why, why is it so important to sort of go down to the understanding of the epistemology to, as key, I suppose? Well, uh, that is the thing that we're, we're in the most complicated. So we're also seeing in the people on Twitter who tell you to stay in your lane. So this all comes down to the difference in epistemology and a problem, a disconnect that people are having with understanding um, what the social justice scholars and activists are talking about, um, as sort of averse to what the, the general liberals are talking about, is that they're not realising this sort of fatal disconnect on the level of knowledge. If you understand that the activists you're talking to, that the scholars you're reading are working on knowledge as something that belongs to a certain identity group rather than something which is out there to be found and can be um, found by anyone regardless of their identity then a lot of the the confusion and the um and the disconnection um is explained so that that's why i keep saying we have to look at epistemology and jim keeps saying to me if you could just say knowledge instead this would make things a lot a lot easier and he's quite right so that is what i'm trying to do the knowledge okay okay <laughs> so 
Let's do, okay. I know this isn't going to be quick, but we do have a little bit of time. Okay, so can we do a bit of a crash course in the knowledge? Yes. How do we know things in, I guess, what people would think in the traditional sense compared to an applied postmodernist who bought into the rhetoric there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're we're looking, I know this is going to be very, very sort of um, simple and basic themes which have changed over history because although there's a lot of that isn't really suitable for a, a podcast. So um, anybody who wants to say that I'm being reductionist, just get over it and, and listen. This is okay. general. Okay, yes, okay, so, that's why I asked. I right. asked specifically for a crash course. <laughs> at ways that we have understood knowledge um, historically. Okay. So if we're looking at the medieval um, period, for example, which is, is my area of study, the late medieval period, right. knowledge and how we, discuss, how we obtained knowledge was understood to be through God. That was the ultimate source of knowledge. It was in the holy texts which were um, translated and interpreted uh, correctly by the priests. Right. And this is a kind of epistemology then. So this epistemology is faith, it's scripture, it's divine revelation. Mm -hmm. How do we know what's true? Said so. Then when we came into the modern period, then we saw a change. We saw Renaissance humanism uh, arrived and, and it started looking much more at art and more at, um, at science and different ways of exploring things. It looked at the Greeks and it looked at the Hebrews. So it wasn't any more that we were only interested in knowledge that came from um, Catholicism. And we had the Reformation in mm -hmm. which people were able to um, interpret the Bible for themselves and they could come to different conclusions about it. We've had the age of science, we've had the Enlightenment, we've had mm -hmm. the emergence of and what's happened over this time is a gradual refining of the idea that science is uh, that knowledge is best obtained using evidence and reason. Okay. That that's became the dominant epistemology, the dominant way of um, knowing things in the modern period, and it replaced the religious faith-based way of knowing things. Right. Now, when the postmodernists came along, the reason they're saying that they are postmodernists is because they are so over this modern idea of knowledge. They're this so modern over idea. it. They're just yes. They're over they it. They are post it. Yes. <laughs> so that they're, they're not believing in any of that anymore and they are looking at what they call um, meta narratives which is big explanations for things mm -hmm. so they're critical of things like christianity which explains a lot they're critical of things like marxism which um, aims to sort of say how society works mm -hmm. but they're critical of science and reason as well they're looking at that as a western philosophical tradition a western scientific tradition and they think that it's as much constructed as any, uh, yeah, any cultural, any spiritual, any religious belief anywhere else in the world. We only think that that is the way to obtain knowledge because we have been raised in it. Right. What do they come up with to replace? Do they have anything to replace these narratives? Yep. What they are interested in now is um, mini narratives, local narratives, because these have been um, unfairly disadvantaged, according to the postmodernists. So postmodern, so not applied postmodernists, but the modern, sorry, the postmodernists were yep. fans. I've never heard this. Okay, <laughs> because I, I, I mean, I spoke with Mike and Jim a few months back, but we didn't cover that. I didn't even think to ask that. That's why you got to keep looking <sighs> in. That's why I keep coming back because I'm like I think I'm missing stuff. I'm still. I'm still <laughs> well, missing. I'm very glad you're asking me about epistemology, and I, I will be telling Mike and and um, and Jim about this later. Oh, good. So well, <laughs> then, well, well, you know, someday I would like to, uh, to, if if the connection allows me, I'd like to have all of you guys on. <laughs> maybe yeah. when the maybe when the documentary comes out, I'll have like I'll. Anyway. Yeah. So um, sorry that was a. Uh, a little different <laughs> for me. So, okay. So the postmodernists were like, oh, what about local narratives? Is that, that's what they thought of could be the replacement? Is the, like, as in local, like, tri like tribal in the sort of, like, city, like, yeah, kind of like Greek city-state, kind of like smaller groups of people can have, look at their, their local stuff? Is that it? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, lots of, um, like, uh, it, it was um, Jean-Francois Lyotard who spoke about meta-narratives and mini-narratives most explicitly. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that we are losing touch with small local knowledges because we've just got this whole idea of reason of science now. It's got so much power. It's in government and everything. So we need to look back at smaller knowledges. And other people, um, say Foucault, for example, he looked much more at the level of identity and um, position in society. So he's been very, very influential. He looked particularly at sexuality um, and mental illness and um, and these kinds of things. And he argued that we've been there's been a kind of biopower in which science has come in and categorized everything and put everything in positions. And it's taken this strong dominant story about what's normal and what isn't. It's legitimized it in society. Everybody's learnt it. And then they enforce it by talking about it all through um, oh. all, all areas of society. And like, like, is that through language? Is that, yeah. Is that the the thing about the language? I'm so, I'm so like articulate. The thing about language. <laughs> so can you okay, can you explain what the thing about language that I'm trying to talk about? What what that means? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a really good example with with Foucault because he's he's the one who is really of most interest here. Okay. So he has come up with this um this, this concept of, of discourses. Mm -hmm. A lot of the others. Uh, spoke about that as well but let's look at Foucault and discourses at the moment so he looked at epistemes which is ways of knowing things and discourses which is the ways of talking about them mm -hmm. so if we go back to our first example where we had the religious um, sort of over overpowering element of society the knowledge then would be Christianity the discourse would be talking in terms of Christianity okay. so he then saw um, modernity as bringing up all these new categories where um, heterosexuality is normal homosexuality is deviant there is um, mental health and there's mental illness and it's um, all these these knowledges, these received wisdoms, which operate in the service of the powerful, but they're they're spread by by everyone, and we can see a certain amount of truth in that. If we think of of a society in which um, people are dominated by one kind of ideology, like say a, a Christian one or a Muslim one, before it isn't just the priests who are saying it; it's not just the people in universities. The average person is also speaking as though these things are true. Okay. And so they just get constructed as truth and then spread. And so this, this was a change because for the Marxists, they had believed that the powerful deliberately just oppressed everybody else. Foucault and the other postmodernists came along and said, no, that's not quite how it works. What happens is that certain ideas, certain knowledges get understood to be truth. And then everybody accepts that and everyone spreads it and they make it true by living it. And so we have this idea. Yeah. Lived. So I'm like lived experience yeah. is coming into my head. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yes, yeah. we'll get to that when we get to the applied postmodernism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then, so we've got somebody else who's very important as well, um, Jacques Derrida. And you may have heard of, of deconstruction, mm -hmm. which was his approach to things. And so if we're now understanding this society as constructed in language, in systems of power that are producing knowledge... Um, Derrida is, is leading the drive to to deconstruct these these ideas of knowledge that we have in society, and he's doing this in on the level of language. Okay. So he's arguing that we the language is just unreliable. What people understand is just as important as what the speaker meant. That we can interpret things any way we like. We've only chosen to interpret them this way because we've been taught to. And so the the deconstructionists or the or the post um, structurists they wanted to take all of these these structures of knowledge down and that included all the dominant narratives of of um, of religion of the enlightenment of progress of science of reason and that that was the the okay. first lot and when they were <laughs> it just seems crazy <laughs> it's so okay and then replace it with local narratives is that Correct. Yeah. What, what was yes, what was an example ways, though of a local narrative 
that they gave. Well, th- this is this is where we have to understand the difference between the first postmodernists and the next wave. The first postmodernists made some noises about um, wanting to get back to mini narratives, but they they didn't do anything. They were the the deconstructive wave. They were taking everything apart. Mm-hmm. And they were fairly aimless. They, they didn't really think that much could be achieved. They just wanted to point out the problems with the structures that were there. Okay. So it took the next wave, the applied postmodernists in the late 80s, oh. to say, well, this is a bit pointless. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've, yeah. We have a castle that the the big guys came and, you know, pushed over. And now we need to rebuild yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, yeah, so that that's what happened. The the um, the first postmodernists they really burnt themselves out because once you've taken everything apart, there isn't much you can do. So there, all this writing started sort of drying up in the middle of the eighties, mm-hmm. and then in the late eighties and nineties, then came the rise of these these sort of theories which drew on postmodernism and they came along and said okay so it's good that we understand knowledge as social construct it's good that we understand that um, it's constructed in the service of power and it's related to identity but we have to accept some things are real so we have to accept that this oppression um, is real these systems of power are real Mm -hmm. and then we have to try and reconstruct things yes so I watched uh jim on uh, benjamin boyce's channel he like i think it was just a couple days ago so he he kind of did a, a like a i'm oppressed so therefore i am kind <laughs> of idea <laughs> which he's like i don't want to give them you know the lofty comparison to descartes here but it but it's It's kind of, that rings kind of true. Like, I'm oppressed, therefore I am. We cannot reduce, we cannot take apart the oppression. That's the sacred cow. Mm. We're leaving that, and and then we go from there. We built, we sort of like the tree is built, is grown through the oppression. And and then that's what Mm. you guys were working on, exposing in your, I don't want to call it a hoax, because it wasn't a hoax. That's Mm. something that, I remember in the little snippet that Mike has out of the sort of uh, trailer almost for the documentary is that I think Jim points out that you can't, they didn't, or they, you're you, (laughs) you're part of the they. You guys couldn't, you tried initially to do hoax stuff and it didn't work so you had to do it for real. Can you, and maybe, I don't know where you came in, maybe you came in and the helping of the real, I don't know where you came in in this. Do you know what I'm talking about though? Yeah. So why yeah, why do. does it have to be real? What you guys do? Um, well, okay, yeah, this this is a different kind of of real. Yeah, when when we started the um the second the the project the, mm-hmm. to really get as many out there as we could, James and, and Peter at first tried just grabbing some key ideas with some ridiculous um, theses and, and sort of situating them roughly within the fields. But that wasn't good enough. They really had to get in um, in depth to the theories. And it's, you know, it, it's not profound. It's not... Um, there's not a lot of substance there, but it is extremely complicated. It is very, very difficult to navigate. So in order to write papers that will be accepted, there's an awful lot that you have to know about how the theories work and how they sort of work with each other. So the papers that we ended up writing and getting better and better at writing are uh, really quite indistinguishable from the real papers that are out there. That's why it's not really right to say that it's a hoax they didn't let these things in by mistake they let them in because that's what they're letting in they just didn't know that we weren't um, sincere sincere and writing it because it that's the thing i think that sort of explains a lot because it seems so how often have i used have i seen people use on twitter this is ridiculous you know anything that seems like talking about the uh I don't know, like lived experience, uh, over superseding, you know, I don't know, like there's no such thing as biological sex anymore. Like even like fine gender will give you that, but no, not in you know, biological sex. And not all, but some are going that far, right? And 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 I've seen a lot of like, that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. But but it's it's actually not ridiculous because it's very 
thought out and and like what you said it, it it's actually got a it's not profound but it does it's w- rather complicated and has its base in the theory mm. and so so mm. i think that's why i just wanted to point that out because just to kind of bridge that gap of like okay why couldn't it be a hoax because it's yeah so ultimately because it's just so complicated i guess um mm. maybe that's why the rest of us have trouble understanding it because it's so complicated <laughs> Why is it yeah, so complicated? Uh, like, why? 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 Yeah. Well, the thing is, it it isn't as complicated as people think it is. So in the book that Jim and I are writing at the moment, we're trying to draw out um, some principles and themes, which are really quite simple. And once you've got your head around those, then the meaning kind of clicks into place. But okay. what is complicated is the number of, of conversations that have happened, the papers that have happened, the back and forth that have happened, that have added a lot of detail, a lot of jargon and terminology. And you can so easily step on a minefield by not gauging it quite right. But the the underlying ideas are really very simple. They're actually more simple than the idea that we, we get knowledge from... Um, from, from evidence and reason, and we try to make society ethical by giving everybody the same opportunities. It's it's more, it's simpler, their construction of society, which is really like this power grid of people just plotted in by their, their gender, race, sexuality, disability, weight, you know, and mm. with all these sort of systems of power going on. And so you're having people saying, I am speaking as a uh, fat um, lesbian woman of colour. Then you are understood to be speaking from certain positions of knowledge. Right. And, and so it's um, the, the, the really most troubling thing about this is that it really tries to keep science and reason as a male and white thing, which is really horribly racist and sexist. Mm-hmm. And the majority of um, of women and, and non-white people don't believe that, that science and reason is not for them. So it, it's um, both presumptuous and um, unethical in the way that it, it's, it's coming now. <laughs> so do you guys have a title for your book, by the way? Um, we're, we're just settling on that um, right at this moment, actually. The, okay. the publisher is back and forth, so I won't say just okay. in case there's a last-minute change. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. So the book is a sort of, it's like a little, ha- like, I'm sorry, I have no idea how little or big it will be, but it's a handbook for uh, the masses, I guess, to understand post or applied postmodernism, or is it to understand postmodernism and applied postmodernism? Yeah, we we start by explaining what postmodernism was and then pulling out a few of the core ideas of it. Then we're showing how these ideas got carried on into the next wave in the late 80s and early 90s. So we we spend some time explaining that and then we look at the different um, theories that arose, post-colonialism, critical race theory, queer theory, um, intersectional feminism, disabled, and then we sort of went in then to sort of uh, more complex studies, so disability studies and fat studies and um, social justice epistemology and, and all these ideas which have started off with the postmodernists who are really quite big and messy. Mm-hmm. Then a few ideas have been taken out of that. They've been refined. They've been simplified. They've gone on into the next wave of scholarship, which looks quite different. It's much more political. It's accepting some truth. It's accepting that society is structured um, in terms of power and privilege according to identity. Mm-hmm. And it's it's uh, demanding everybody accept that. And then it's coming sort of within the last 10 years, there's been a sort of further solidification of these ideas into a kind of generic social justice scholarship which is um it's really trying to do everything at once because the idea of intersectionality which is when different um, aspects of marginalized identity sort of overlap and cause a more complicated problem right the idea of intersectionality now has become so popular and so overwhelming that it really <coughs> guides 
social justice scholarship. So we, you can't really just look at sexism or even just at racism or trans issues. You, you're expected to look at, at um, different levels and different layers all, all at the same time. So it is messy, it is confusing, but it, it's not really complicated if you understand what's going on. Right. Okay, so, okay. <coughs> I, I'm going to use myself as an example because I remember watching a documentary a while ago. I don't know how many years, a number of years ago. We'll say five. And it was basically, it was explaining about the... I think like how men can't be emotional in society or something. Um, oh, did you freeze? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Well, you've frozen. Shoot. Oh, well, whatever. Oh, yes, I can, I can see. Oh, well, it'll, it'll, well, as long as I can hear you, that's fine. Um, this, this documentary was about like, I think men and women and how, you know, the stereotypes I think of both and and then they went through different um definitions and one of them was how the oppressor can never be oppressed and so Mm -hmm. if you're a white man you can discriminate against a woman or white woman even but if you're a white woman you can't discriminate against a white man Mm -hmm. so uh, or you could switch those up into however many different you know versions there are and um, and I was and they gave that sort of like racism equals prejudice plus power. I think that's kind of the idea that was being given. And I was like, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. Oh, huh. like and I just was like, OK, like and I didn't really. And that's it. And I just I just I thought, oh, racism, you can't really like you can only what is it? I, I, like people can't be racist while punching up, I guess, is that. The way you say it mm. so it was like oh okay cool I didn't know that that was the the definition anyway moving on and then I just never came back to it until I got on uh well I started listening to different you know of you you intellectual types and on podcasts and then started getting on Twitter and then oh and and that's what that was and so it's like oh no that mm. wasn't that's not right you know but it didn't affect me it didn't affect my life. It didn't change a ton. It just happened to be something I filed in the memory banks and then kind of came back when I heard what it really is. But mm. some people might not, it might affect them and they might not even know the epistemology <laughs> behind it, right? So what do you, mm. I guess, like, what do you do? How do you, rather than read your book? <laughs> <laughs> like what do you like do you know I, I, like, what what are you con- like I'm concerned for people who are just like oh I don't want to be racist and and then who don't go beyond hearing these little snippets through the media it's in vogue with the media so they'll kind of push it through. Yeah. So what do you think of that? This is where I think we we have to again pull everything apart and look at what's happening, because what you've just described here is another difference between um, the sort of modern ideas and the postmodern ideas. Mm -hmm. So in the modern conception, we have got a liberal idea of society and the liberals have the individual and the universal. So they are focused very much on removing all barriers from any individual so that they can um, access all that society has to offer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the individual is the person we're concerned about and we're, and there's, there's a universal human nature, universal human rights. Mm-hmm. So that is what came along with modern liberalism. When the postmodernists um, came along, they said that what was being called individuality and what was being called universality was actually just white western male ideas and so they went for the other layer which is group identity in the middle and they weren't wrong that this had been somewhat neglected by by the liberals with their idea of treat people the same regardless of identity but they reversed this and said no we we put the identity first Mm -hmm. so Kimberly Crenshaw for example in her Um, where she's setting out um, intersectionality, she says, look at the difference between I am black and I am a person who happens to be black. She advises against putting the person first because there's a universality to that which she saw as unempowering. She wanted to put identity first 
and speak from it. So we've got this situation now where what they are looking at is not this idea of individuals interacting with each other, but power groups interacting with each other. So the dominant and marginalised groups in society. But if you put so the if marginalized, of, so if you put it, if you put the marginalized group first, then that gives you a disadvantage, because if everyone puts their individual for individuality first, regardless of power group, then that's first. Whether you're up or low, that's, that's or the down. liberal. Yeah, that, that's that's the liberal conception of it. It seems so. Um, obviously the right way to go about things but what the postmodernists and then particularly the applied postmodernists have done is is complicated that they've said this idea the individual is a white male thing oh right so when i do what, okay, but how is it empowering for them to put their group first how is that empowering to them well what what they want to do because we're back to the whole knowledge um thing again is they want to get um a sort of a group identity to come together and to push back at this other sort of dominant knowledge and say we have experiences too we're coming from a different place and you need to listen to what's happening to us and not keep claiming that your view is universal and that the individual is what white men are so we need to look more at group identities again okay. and when you're looking at you know so when, when we're looking at racism if we're thinking in terms of the individual if a white person comes up and calls a black person a racist name and if a black person does this to a, a white person this is equal they are both uh, breaking a principle of non-discrimination and they are being racist but if we're looking at power groups which we're seeing in a different place what we've got is a racist system where white people are just constantly oppressing people of color mm -hmm. so if an individual from a from a sort of non-white group comes and says something nasty about white people they're not considered to be racist because they can't really affect that group the power really balance power, remains right. the same. Right. Yeah. So if white people are racist, it's an expression of that power. If black or brown people are racist, it's a resistance of the power. Oh, it's not oh, racism. It's fight the power. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What? Okay. When it comes to mm. experience as a way of knowing, is mm. there validity in that? Because it seems, okay, I might be wrong, but it, it seems like there is some validity to a lived experience because it is your way of going about life. And that's how we be make our, our own identities as our memories. So is there, that There's validity. It depends what you want to know. Let, let, let's imagine a conversation between you and me now, and we'll go into the realms of fat studies. So if... Uh, you would want to, if you, a slim person, wanted to know what it's like to live as a an overweight person, I could give you the experience of that. I could tell you that it hurts my knees, that it's uncomfortable. This could be um, interesting. This could be of interest to people because it is it is knowledge. Right. So there's that experiential knowledge there. But what I couldn't do is say I am fat, therefore I can say that um, being overweight is healthy because there's an objective knowledge there this is my experience of being overweight is different to the known medical facts of the implications of obesity so it isn't that it's not important mm -hmm. um, what people are experiencing particularly if large numbers of people are saying they're experiencing it mm -hmm. it's that it isn't the same thing as the ob objective knowledge about a thing and that's what's getting conflated okay Okay, so that's, I think, something that's important to point out because often the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater here. So it's like, don't tell me that I don't have my lived experience is what I see for pushback on Twitter and stuff mm. like that. And so it's, I suppose it's, um, it's not that you're saying that. It's just a different way of knowing. It's an well, anecdotal, right? It, is that kind of the realm where it is? It's even simpler than that. It, it's what do you want to know? So, OK, here's, here's another sort of quite good example when you'll say people will say men have no right um, to talk about pregnancy. 
or something like mm. because only women can talk about this. Again, this is the thing. If somebody wants to know what the experience of giving birth is like, they will mm. need to to speak to a woman who has experienced this and she can talk about the pain of it from a personal mm -hmm. perspective this can be very useful to know particularly if you get a lot of this information and you're talking about what helps and um and you know understanding how to alleviate experiences right. but the woman who can tell you how it feels to have a baby is not it doesn't have the same knowledge as an obstetrician who has studied this in depth knows what is happening within the body and could be a man right so when what we're likely to see is people taking this experiential knowledge and putting it on top of factual right. knowledge okay and that they're trying to sort of outweigh it um with that so when uh, something i think is important if we're talking about this like when when jim and i wrote our um our piece on on a rational and liberal uh, approach to trans identity we mm -hmm. called it we immediately got deluged with people saying why are you writing it when you're not trans why didn't you ask any trans people for their experiences and we had to explain to them this our piece isn't an account of trans experience a piece on with of trans people talking about their experiences could be a very valuable piece ours wasn't one ours was an argument for how society can treat people fairly and it isn't about experiences it's an it's an argument so we have evidence and we have reasoned arguments and we have experience in the best of both worlds these things are important and, and often will overlap right but they they are they are different things. We can't start saying, well, you don't have the right to talk about racism because you're white. You can't um, talk about pregnancy because you're male. Because we're, we're talking about differences between objective facts and and experiences. Right. And there is a difference. <laughs> they can align, mm. like you said. It, it doesn't mean you... It, it, I mean, it doesn't even mean that you have to value one more than another. It's right. just don't conflate them. Most of the time, we humans are more interested <coughs> in how things feel than what what has happened. Right. So, I mean, if you were to take an example of a woman who's lost her baby, now there are objective facts here about um, about sudden infant death syndrome. That's that's um, the, uh, can be the facts of the matter. Mm -hmm. But what everybody else isn't likely to be concerned about is how is she feeling? How is she coping? What can we do to help? Right. So being human often means that we are more interested in how people are feeling about things than what the facts of the things are. Okay. It's just that within certain kinds of um, social justice scholarship, there has been a tendency to try to overrule, um, you know, make truth claims on a wide societal level using... Um, a particular ideologically motivated interpretation of an experience mm. and that is, is really quite a recipe for disaster do you have an example um i mean you gave okay, me some well, really nice examples that... earlier sorry but i just that yeah i would love to hear one. okay I, i'm gonna do what i'm gonna give one which which might actually make it um, clearer to people who are um, um, sort of sympathetic to social justice arguments. So okay. say, for example, here, and this, this is um, a true um, account of something that's happened in the UK. There was a survey done and people were asked what percentage of the population they thought was Muslim. The uh, British people answered with an average of 21%. That was their perception. The real number is 5%. So oh. what we're looking at here, yeah, there's a big, big gap here. And um, what we have got is the, the truth, 5% of Brits are Muslim, and this perception. Now, that this perception is wrong, but that doesn't mean it isn't important. What That is actually the most interesting thing here. Why are British people so much overestimating the population of Muslims? We could then look into that. There can be a fear of cultural clash. There can be a fear of being overtaken. These fears are something that actually do need to be addressed for societal cohesion. So we are mm. interested in the experience but right. what we wouldn't do is accept these experiences true and say we need to stop having muslim people and we need for muslim people to stop being overpowering because okay. the experience needs to be owned differently and if mm. we were to look at this with something with um feminists for example saying that their experience 
is that um, men are um, abusive, that they're condescending. You know, there, there could be facts of this matter and there could be interpretations. It doesn't mean that this the experience that um, women are having of men being generally um, hostile and domineering or whatever isn't um, an important one, but there might also be facts of the matter which are different. And the idea is to see why we're thinking this when this is, is true. Okay. So... Keeping these separate are impo- is important. Okay. Well, it's. I'm glad you. That is a very good example because we don't. We need to know what people are feeling. It's important because we're mm-hmm. not just um, objective beings going through the universe. We do have feelings. Mm, and and there are objective um, facts about what people are feeling. It is objectively true that 21% of the British, uh, the Brits thought an average of 21% of people, of, of us were Muslim. That's an objective fact. Right. It can be an objective fact that, um, an, a, you know, a, a majority of women feel afraid if they're walking alone at night and there's a man behind them. Mm-hmm. So this isn't, you know, this this can be objectively true what isn't objectively true is that that man is is therefore dangerous right yes so, <laughs> yeah so sort of teasing out like there it's valid here but not there so yeah okay well, so okay so bring in the real world because it does when you are in it you're looking you're looking at the scholarship you're looking at it in academia on tw- if people are on twitter we see it a lot because that's what often gets Tweeted in, particularly the circle I'm in, probably the circle that you're in and Twitter, we see a lot, like, it feels like identity politics are taking over. But mm. a lot of people are also are like, oh, that's not really real because it's Twitter. <laughs> and or, well, that's just mm. academia. It's not in. OK, what do you see of this sort of the rhetoric being in the real world? It's, sorry, real world. It, I feel like it is to an extent, mm. but, but can you give me, yeah, to what extent you think it is sort of disseminating through like media or um, education? How much is, re- is really, do we need to, I guess, I don't want to say fear. I don't want to, how much is, is actually affecting society, this um, sort of applied postmodernism? Okay, well, first of all, I don't think the majority of people are. Um, applied postmodernists. I don't think they um, subscribe or even understand this concept of a society um, constructed in systems of power via language. But that doesn't mean they cannot be affected by it. I think studies have shown that something like only 12% of people um, support identity politics and um, sort of the ideas of political correctness, which is how the general public will understand um, what it is we're looking at. Those are the terms around it. So I think most people are still generally liberal, but these ideas have got a lot of influence. So we are looking now at um, diversity and inclusion um, officers, particularly in universities, but also in in governments, in um, professions, in um, in trade unions. So we have these these ideas, and that they're, they're com- people are being trained um, in the universities, and they're coming out, and they are then advising um, companies on all sort of levels of society. So you might get um, some strange. Um, sort of rules coming in where you have to be careful with how you're using gendered terms, certain um, words shouldn't be used, then there are um, things set up for for women to report sort of being um, made to feel uncomfortable and then this this can be quite sort of ideologically interpreted. So we've got things like this which are sort of manifesting in in different ways um, generally in society. So my my daughter's um, school, for example, is having diversity week um, oh. This week, before they break up. Right, I remember. Yeah, you, 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 you talked to the, this the headmaster or the principal. How'd that yes, go? I did. Uh, well, she sent me through some information. It, it didn't look like much, but my daughter came back and she said that she'd had 
the one of her class that had um, done the diversity thing was her business studies. And in that, they'd um, talked about statistics and um, underrepresentation of, of women and ethnic minorities in some fields and um, why it was important that this was rectified. Okay. And so I, I talked to my daughter about that and she said she didn't think that um, the statistics had been read very well because the showing the imbalance doesn't show why mm -hmm. there's an imbalance and assuming discrimination is really an ideological thing. So I, I was quite pleased that she'd seen that. Okay. But we will hear it on... <laughs> You know, when when we get requests for companies to reveal their um, gendered pay gap, and this isn't done with a great amount of nuance, so we end up finding airlines are considered to have huge um, gender pay gaps because 90% of the men are pilots and 90% of the women are um, air hostesses. This isn't taken right. into account. So we're, we're getting these kind of pressures throughout society. We're seeing things in media where... Um, and, and in art, where uh, people are feeling under pressure to have um, more representation of various groups, to be careful how they present uh, certain um, types of people, that uh, not to appropriate um, ideas if, if they're not yours. Right. So um, Aereo at the moment is getting quite a lot of um, artists and writers who are uh, right, who are sending us pieces about the pressure that they are under to both represent um, diverse characters in their art, but also not um, appropriate the experiences of those characters. What? Yes. Oh my! Oh my gosh! That sounds like mm. a nightmare. If I was an artist, like how yeah, do you? I, I... What is the law? Like how do you? have someone of per, a person of color come in and write that character for you like it's it I mean, doesn't I, make I think sense most writers can carry on and and not um have to do this i, I was just reading um a, a latest jonathan kellerman book in which he was quite critical of this and he hasn't been subject to a dog pile but we I, I think at the moment it's it's a bit like um, sort of luck you're you're probably going to be able to most of what you'd normally do as normal you might think there's not too much of a problem but if somebody um, takes it into their mind to object to something that you have done mm -hmm. a, a book that you've written or a, some art that you've made or you know then or a comment that you've made to a colleague in the in the dining room yeah. if somebody politically motivated enough wants to make a case out of this then you really are likely to be doomed because these ideas do have power companies are under pressure to be diverse to be inclusive to sort of not alienate um uh, sort of certain groups so the, it's the ideas that have power rather than a majority of people accepting them it's that they have power and should um, someone want to use that power in any situation you you could be very vulnerable okay because i speaking of that uh, the uh Macy's had a, a set of plates that someone objected to. Did you see? Oh, you've been off. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? It was. No, I don't it, think it's, so. it was like it showed portion like a cir like a bunch of circles within. You know, it's so like a circle and then getting bigger and then getting bigger, and then oh, I of, did see that. One actually, of them yes. said like mom <laughs> jeans, and it was like the biggest one. Anyway, mm -hmm. someone complained, and Macy's wrote back mm. quite quickly on Twitter mm. and was like, yeah, we missed the mark with this line. Sorry, we'll be removing them. And then she went and said, basically, they better be. And if I see them in, say, like, you know, an outlet store, you better watch it or something like that. And, you know, like she you know, like threatening almost. And I was like, mm. and these companies, like Macy's is like how old and how many much money worth much how much money they're like mm. they're at the mercy of these people who decide they don't like certain things because of how it makes you feel or look or might be implying anyway mm. uh, it just looks like if you can get a little bit of power why wouldn't you why wouldn't you subscribe to mm. this like right like so that's why I don't People say, well, I don't see it in everyday life. Well, the bit that we do see it seems rather powerful, though. 
Like when corporations mm. listen uh, to someone complaining on Twitter and then they remove that line of plates. Yeah. Right? So the, yeah. how do um, you I, see I, it? I, I think you... Yeah, you, you're just like not likely to see it and, until you see it. And we have to, we're very vulnerable to this at the moment because we have so recently had the civil rights movements and they've been rectifying some very serious wrongs. You know, that there's been, been um, legal discrimination against women and black people. It's been illegal to be gay and really very recently. So we had this great rush of um, moral advance on this where mm. we can no longer discriminate against women or people of colour. We can't, um, you know, same-sex couples can can now get married. There's been this sort of great advance, but we're in this new position where we're just realising how how unjust, unjust things were so recently. And so there's a drive to keep feeling very positively about feminism, about anti-racism activism, activism, LGBT activism, and they have moral power because they have been so right Okay. Um, so recently. <laughs> right. That makes sense. Okay. So we don't want to lose our understanding that <clears throat> because when you subscribe to a certain way of thinking, it's easy to just dismiss everyone on the other side. So oh. there is a danger for those of us who are looking out for the dangers of social justice to almost... Oh, whatever. It's we figured it out. There's no more racism. There's no more whatever. I don't know. Like, you know, like homophobia. What it's easy to almost fall in that groove. And so we I know, like you said, it's so recent that we've righted these wrongs. And and mm. so we but we don't want to just think that there's nothing wrong. But then it's also easy, of course, to go too far the other way and say, well, it's all still very bad. So it's like mm. a kind of line to to walk to mm. to understand, and it's hard to be in the right oh. line. The, the, this is this is how it happened because we had the big liberal wave between um, the sixties and eighties. Mm. So um, that that was the time of the you know the civil rights movement, second wave feminism, gay pride. Mm. We had all of that. Um, going on when that had achieved sort of a legal equality it began to see diminishing returns and what was left was to address uh, racist sexist homophobic attitudes mm -hmm. so what remained was to address discourses so it isn't a coincidence that it was at this time that postmodernism had its second wave and it tagged on to the ends of these civil rights movements and it, it borrowed their legitimacy right. as the next step of achieving social justice okay but using going through these sort of ideas and language right route. so what would your suggestion be if say you are if someone's watching this then they're probably like not on the applied postmodern side so and if they are <laughs> cool um but if they're not they're probably like they might know no people who kind of lean you know in that direction how do you how do you talk with someone who is i guess sort of ideologically possessed by this without just becoming part of the problem i i think the number the people who are really ideologically possessed are not reachable um, at this moment, but I think they're few and there is a greater number of people who really don't want to be racist, sexist or homophobic right. and who are inclined to be sympathetic to activism um, against it right. and not to see another option. So there can be a feeling what we have to go with social justice or we're going with um, right wing sort of racists. But what right. I think we, those of us who still value consistent liberal ethics need to do is really articulate a different option. And so James and I, we've written a couple of pieces on this. And one of them is um, no identity politics does not continue the work of the civil rights movements because we wanted to show the difference between a liberal um, aim for gender equality, racial equality, LGBT equality, and this social justice postmodern okay. approach. And that is something we need to do because we've, Take, started to take it for granted that it is just wrong to judge people by immutable characteristics right. that um, 
there should be consistent um, principles. It's fair um, to, that everybody has the opportunities and nobody should have barriers. We haven't had to defend this. For a lot of us, you know, anybody under 50, certainly, we haven't had to defend um, this very much against um, conservative elements or any elements. Right. So now we've got, we, we're kind of out of out of the habit of standing up for consistent liberal principles because they've been the water we swim in. So I think we need to learn how to do that again. Okay. We need to look at what's happening in social justice and then say, I agree with your aims. I don't agree with your methods. This is why. This is what we should do instead. Perfect. So we can show people that there is a a liberal way forwards that we don't have to either be social justice activists or racist, sexist and homophobic. Right. There's there's another approach and we all already know it. We just don't know how to stand up for it. Right. Oh, that was. Oh, I wanted to end on a good note. I feel <laughs> like we did. OK, well, what what is next for you guys, for uh, your little crew? Uh, well, we're talking. At the moment, we're focused on Jim and, and Peter's book. It's, it's going to be coming out soon. We're uh, finishing off uh, my one. Okay. So we're, we're looking mostly at the books we're writing. We're thinking about setting up some kind of uh, foundation where we can break things down, get materials out to people, mm -hmm. um, sort of get people to come together and support each other. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about that um, when, we've, when we've got more idea how we're going to do it. And um, then we'll be telling people and asking them how, how we can help them. Well, do you think you might go like uh, doing little speaking engagements around with these pamphlets, yeah. passing them out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm hoping at the moment that my ideal would be that we would have some very sort of introductory material that um, people could um, could get the idea, then kind of intermediate and an advanced um, level. And that, mm. that was actually Jim's uh, uh, suggestion. We'd like to perhaps have student groups Oh, cool. uh, that we could provide resources to. I'm because I'm I'm in the UK and um, you know my island is very small. I'm hoping when I I'm finished my my book, I'm going to reach out to a lot of student groups and um, offer um, to to connect with them because they they keep writing to me and asking me to come and talk. Uh -huh. But if they're in you know Edinburgh or something and they don't have um, funding to get me there, right? That's um, that's harder for me to to do so i'm going to try and find a way that i can say yes to doing this give student groups a bit of um support give them some information because i, I think the way forward is for there to be a pushback within universities and for right. for sort of reasonable liberal students to feel supported well that would be so great i maybe you could set up a little <laughs> patreon of some kind and uh you can get to <laughs> Get around your little island and people can, can yeah. give you that or, or buy your book. That would probably be helpful as well. So, well, I'm looking forward yeah. to hearing or to your hearing the title and, and for when it comes out. And uh, do you know when it'll be out, your book? It, it should be spring of next year. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll be keeping keeping <laughs> that date in mind or whatever. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have you guys on when, when your books come out. Okay. So, um... I guess is there any did I leave did I miss anything? Is there anything that you kind of anything that you'd like to add? Um no, I I, I think something that um uh, one of the best resources that our team has at the moment is um Mike Naylor's videos. Right. So I I would yeah, in, we're hoping to get a lot more of, of those out to have him as well sort of um putting his perspective across because he came into this quite um late and he's kind of learnt from us as he's he's come away and he's learnt what we have been studying mm -hmm. um on the level where he's talking about it to um people without backgrounds in it so mm. Yeah, I, I think it's um, one of the most important things moment is kind of watch the space with what um, is coming out of um, Mike Nainer's videos, right. because that's, I think, going to bridge that gap between the sort of arcane academic language and um, common experience. Yeah, he the way he explained, actually, um, the sort of people reacting to uh, the applied postmodern movement and not understanding what's going on with it. Like he explained it like to me, like, oh, people arguing about the dishes, an old married couple mm -hmm. about the dishes. But then it's actually like a deep seated, like 
yeah. issue like oh that affair from years ago or you know or like when you squandered <laughs> our money in the gambling ring or I don't know whatever but like and they never talk mm. and then and but then you're arguing about surface like like even he said that mm. that it's more surface the whole um like a transgender athletes um issue in women's sports he's like that's more the dishes that's just results mm. like that's just like that's not here and then that's when they, you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, but then Helen's epistemology base, that's where we mm-hmm. need to be. So that was, but that sort of visual, like, because he's very visual with his hand, you know, like, here. But it's oh, here. the hands. Yes, oh, yes. it helped yes, me to, the hands. It really, yeah, the, it helped me understand it very well. So, yeah, I, mm-hmm. I totally agree. Like, he's, he's got a very good mm-hmm. way of relaying it to, to us lay people. Being I, I don't think we'd have... <laughs> I don't think we'd have broken out of our bubble much at all if it if it wasn't for him. So, yeah, oh, yeah we don't we're, we're uh, all underestimate his, that. His, <laughs> his, well, his uh, documentary on you guys to come out. So, mm-hmm. so do you? Sorry, I keep on saying, oh, like maybe we'll finish up, but then I keep having questions. The 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 papers. Do you? Yeah. F- this is actually was what one of the things I did want to ask you specifically. Did did any of the journals or academic people in that sort of academic space see that as a learning opportunity or did they all just react negatively we haven't heard, nobody has come forward and, and said actually you've opened my eyes um thank you i'm going to do things differently now and i, I think that's very very uncommon for anybody to do that okay. i'm hoping that you know some people are distancing themselves from this kind of scholarship some um scholars have come forward and they've been very angry with us but they've also said we don't do that kind of scholarship anyway so if we've made that just a little bit more embarrassing and less reputable and, and we've made people want to distance themselves from it i think that that's um that's a, a sign of progress that's true because you don't know what's going on in the well, maybe they're right, <laughs> right? Mm. You don't know. Well, we'll hope that there's a lot of that going on in the heads of those those people in those spaces. So, yeah, Anyways, let's well, hope so. <laughs> well, you've definitely impacted me with that, with what you guys have done, because it, it helped me to, it led me to understand. I really, I always come back to this because I think it, I really am interested in um, like myths and like world religions and stuff. And mm. and it 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 sort of uh, piques that interest in me. Again, I know that you guys have sort of argued that it is like a, a religion, and I find mm. it very, like, sort of fascinating. <laughs> Even mm. though it's it's, I don't think it's the the best, but it's very interesting to see how people can sort of really alter their ways of thinking towards this and having faith in identity. I guess. Mm. I, I, you know, I came from looking at religious ideology. I used to like to get deep in that. Now I'm, I'm getting deep in this, and I, I have a lot more that I could say about that. But I've, I'm going to have to go because my okay. husband is going right. okay. to work, and uh, I want to see him before yeah, he goes. Because I'm going, I'll be gone before yes. he okay. gets home tomorrow. Well, I will uh, <laughs> stop. And uh, well, thank you for chatting with me. So this was wonderful. Yeah, well, th- a great resource. Thank you for being an interesting interviewer. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> oh.